Ah, okay. So, so you know the right fellow here and former president of India. Thank you, Chair. Uh, my question is to the general. Uh, general, thank you very much for a very candid uh, conversation. It was very nice hearing about it. Uh, I was just trying to understand how the process takes place, as you explained, that uh, where the military has supported democracy or supported good governance. You mentioned that even in some military diplomacy, sometimes overstepping, as you said, it's the way the military has helped. Those are your words. Number two, you also said that where you found that there was inability on the part of government to deliver in governance, or where economic governance has been poor, the military has helped and has supported. Where you found that there was politicization of the bureaucracy, or there was feudalism in the political setup, you found that military did help in some ways in um, helping the government. And you also said that the military will not interfere where you say provided there it sees the process in an environment of give and take. You refer to foreign trade and other things. Basically you said that you are seen as sometimes, you refer to it, as overseeing democracy. Now my 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 what I'm intrigued about is that in a environment where uh, there is politicization of the bureaucracy, in an environment where there is probably feudalism in politics or cronyism. I mean, cronyism wouldn't use expression. I, I'm interpreting it that way. How is it that the military has continued to be a citadel, an epitome, or an island of professionalism, credibility, and some, in some ways, conscience keepers of the nation? How have you been able to protect yourself? I might want to take this because people are interested in me as well. I have also a set, set. But let me take this question. Uh, thereafter, in this order, Mr. Berkey, Surya, and Manish. Good question, and I'm glad you listened so carefully to every word I said. The thing is that the military has, over a period of time, tried to help in various ways. I'll just give you a few examples. Uh, for example, I know there are very important civil servants here who have been through the CSP counter, but the Civil Services uh, Academy, Training Academy, and the Civil Services uh, I have training institute, the civil services uh, staff college, administrative staff college. Uh, both, uh, I mean, they're very good institutions, but they were both evaluated by the military and expertise provided for improving the syllabus, for introducing many things which are now functional there. And the uh, civil service is very happy with it. Believe me, they made an enormous difference to the civil services. The civil services college was evaluated by the military. Oh, yes, during military rule, the civil services academy and the civil services administrative college were both supported in re-evaluating the syllabus and introducing various uh, studies which the military had found useful in its own national defense university. So there's one way they had, and they have cool examples, ghost schools, schools set up in uh, remote areas and so on, and in Skardu and Gilgit and other places. So they, they are something, almost all the road works, infrastructure work has been undertaken by a military organization which specializes uh, in uh, civil works and hazardous areas. So all that uh, has gone. Now your uh, specific question that how has the military kept itself uh, insulated? Uh, and I think it ties in with the question that the ambassador of the heart asked from the military, which was about the military, the system as such. I 
think the military is seen as a means of upward social mobility in Pakistan. And its uh, military system, as far as uh, recruitment, training, and promotion is concerned, is an open book. We just have to meet those standards, touch those milestones, and you can be in the military and rising in the military. So that goes a long way in appealing to all segments and we have no problem recruiting, no problem retaining them, no problem training them. No problem training them. And that, is, that is one. The other is that military is uh, discipline, it's uh, the environment in which it functions and so on, they all tend to well, not insulated from society because we are drawing from society and they go back to society relative and so on. But uh, at least it gives them an environment uh, where they can uh, function efficiently and not be exposed to exploitation as some of the other institutions are sometimes.
in this uh, in this institute prompted essentially by what's happening in the United States. And our impression is that policy making in the United States has been militarized. The three gen former generals have taken hold of defining what the U.S. is going to do in both uh, Afghanistan as well as with reference to North Korea. And I'll have uh, Ifti speak to that himself. But he has a very strong view, which is that the military has a role in determining uh, the strategic policies that the civilian government adopts. Now, I recall that you and I were involved in such an experiment uh, under President Farooq uh, when he created what was called, I think it was called CDNS or something like that, where the civilians and uh, the military people sat together and talked about certain things. I don't think it was a great success. Uh, then you mentioned uh, in your presentation that there are now uh, there is now a structure evolving which has military as well as military personnel and so on. So the question really is, and I agree with Ifti's point that uh, military should be formally engaged in determining the overall strategic approach of all countries, particularly those which can play an important role in, uh, in international affairs but that it needs to be formalized. It needs to be moved uh, in a way that there are no surprises uh, in this. Uh, the third point I want to raise is uh, you and I had a bit of an exchange uh, about our program over here. And uh, you made one very interesting point in the response you gave me by email, which you have not mentioned today. And that was, uh, when I said that in our conversations you had once said to me that don't worry, the military is in charge of sort of uh, generals who think in modern ways. Uh, I, won't, I won't use the language that you use, but... <laughs> but uh, and then uh, my friend and uh, your friend, Shudan Nawaz, began to say that there's a lot of influence of uh, new recruits who are coming in from different areas and they are belong to the lower social classes. But then you made a very interesting point, I thought, which I would like you to elaborate on. You said that the military has a very strong culture of its own. And no matter where these people come from, they are then uh, influenced by the military's internal culture. So that leads me to ask, who defines that culture and who manages that culture? Yeah. Uh, just uh, to explain what uh, what my position was that in the American system, I mean, I'm not talking about the legislative system where the military has no role at all, but in the executive system, which is a very important arm of the American uh, government, in fact, it is the preponderant arm of the American government. What was was happening uh, over the course of years was. In the parliamentary system, we have the office of, say, cabinet secretary, who is really the main bureaucratic fallback position of, 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 of governments. In America, that lackey, which is the chief of staff in the White House, and eventually this was an inexorable process that the military would come in and take over not just the NSA, not National Security Office, but also the chief of staff of the, of the White House. And eventually, the president would be surrounded by the military take over all the decisions in the executive. Now this is something that I was building up over the years and now I see it happen actually in effect empirically in the United States today. So that, that was the point I was making. Anyway, it's not, uh, I just wanted to clarify that. Uh, the next speak, uh, question I was, yeah, uh, is it a two finger? Okay, two finger meaning you can come and stay. I think the general Kramer probably did not explain all of his personal experience in that. But I think uh, 
you know, when you choose people for uh, when you choose people for posts, you have not only have to choose them, uh, you have to choose them for their particular post, not as you would choose a factory manager. And unfortunately, some of our senior leaders have chose people factory manager who would follow their instructions to not them. Now, we said about the civil military relations, I think uh, I'm going to say something may embarrass Jeremy Jai Kramer. Jeremy Jai Kramer set an example when he resigned. He resigned exactly because the National Security Council idea that he given that there should be an institutionalized process for decision making. Now, of course, I don't know the exact reasons that he got, but let me tell you, because he does not, uh, as much said, I know, because the person that he spoke to at that day was General Kipuri, who was Chief of General Staff, when he came back after his resignation. And he, generally, he said, General Kipuri asked him how did it go, sir. He said it didn't go down too well. So General Kipuri said, sir, is it time to consult the board members? He said, no, it's not. He knew at that time that he had resigned. He could have at that time, actually, because the army was already moving. Consult the board commanders being taken over. In a way. Then again, he went home. At 4 o'clock, again, he called General Dikuri and the DJ asked And again, he said, uh, the General Dikuri said, it didn't go out too well. But we will sleep over it and we will talk in the morning. When they got out of the thing, the DJ I said, uh, and he told everybody, I'll be garbled. Which garbled? He said, uh, the procedures turned and said, you want me to uh, countermand my chief? So he said, go to sleep, let's go over. And by this time, the movement had already tried to turn the shell down. He could have taken over that day. And generally, when he reached his house, the triple one brigade commander, which is supposed to be the commander, was waiting at his gate. And he said, what are the orders for me? Because things have started a little bit for me. And then he said, everybody's gone mad here. By this time, he said, so the civil authority did today. And that kept on prevailing till the political leader lost his head and decided to sack everybody, chief justice, the president, the army chief, the naval chief, anything, anybody in sight that did not work as that manager. So when things get out of hand, it can happen. But I'm just saying that for the last is that even they were very for that matter, for General Kiani for that matter, right? or the time that time this uh, you know, present chief, they've been given enough, given enough for this thing, the dawn leaves or something like that. But the army has generally concert. The army has this thing. But it's wrong to say that the army did it. They've been sort of dictating terms as it is thought about in India. The army is there, the army is not. It's not a fact. The Indian government does do it. There are problems and there are tensions. Generally, the thing has been worked out. This is Surya Narayana. Yes, yes, yeah, yeah, okay. Just 30 seconds. Yes, okay. See, it's good. It's Take the mic. It's Microphone, Surya Dev. It's good. Microphone. It's good and very good for generals of the army to decide on military strategy, tactics, etc. The point I, I was, he was just making was, uh, for the army to feel that they know the pulse of the people, they're not trained for that. And hence they will oversee democracy. It's a bit of a stretch. And why I'm saying that is, I've been asked that question quite often when I was the Auditor General. Who audits the Auditor General? who oversees the army. Thank you, Surya. This is Surya. Uh, like uh, most non-Pakistanis, I also had reservations about the subject. Identify nationality. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, this question, of course, but I knew briefly uh, General Karama as a democracy-friendly general, and so I was not surprised that he was the person chosen to speak on the subject. The questions I have for him are these. In the case of Panama Gate, you know, there is a general impression, at least outside of Pakistan, that uh, the military tipped the scales against the civilian prime minister of the day. 
regardless of the credentials and otherwise of the civilian privacy of the day. The second question is, uh, Dr. Chaudhary spoke of uh, tactical nuclear weapons. Around the question of strategic nuclear weapons, who in Pakistan controls the proverbial nuclear button? Is it the army chief or the civilian prime minister, if there is a civilian prime minister at a particular time? Thank you. Yes, okay. Uh, firstly, uh, let me get permission. Can I ask two questions? Uh, ask one because then the question, you know, they, they'll lose. Uh, ask one, there'll be time for it. So, okay. Okay, uh, okay, then the, the question I'm choosing to ask is on uh, creating democratic safeguards. Um, General, General Karama, they did mention that, um, that political parties have somehow failed to develop governance and all that. But there's also a counter argument to this is that maybe they've not been given the, 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 the chance to actually um, to, to, to govern because see, no prime minister has uh, completed a full five year term. And also, if you look, you know, we, we're doing the Panama scandal. I think a lot of precious time and resources has, has, has been spent on, on, a, on the PML government trying to, to rescue itself and all that. And, you know, this has actually, I'm sure it has actually hindered the development of uh, Pakistan. Even, you know, just to quote uh, Bilawal, Bilawal, Bilawal Bhutto, he did say that, you know, you know for, for other countries, the foreign minister, we send them overseas to defend our country's position. But in Pakistan, we send our foreign minister to GT Road to protect the PML government. So, okay, the, so the, the point I want to make is on, you know, should, should, should there be some sort of form of safeguards to actually allow the democratic government to complete the term? Let me cite one example, it was the Constitution uh, Amendment, uh, Amendment 18. Where when Zadari was the president, Zadari was the only president of Pakistan that himself actually signed to, to relinquish the powers to dissolve the National Assembly. And let me say, that's the reason why, since democracy has um, come back to Pakistan, the National Assembly has never been dissolved. It's only the Prime Minister has been disqualified, but National Assembly has been there. And you know, uh, General Sir, your, your successor, um, General Musharraf, I follow his interviews very closely. And he has always said that, you know, a, a, a constitution needs a state. If, there's, if the state falls, the constitution falls. So in, in there are times where you have to suspend the constitution in order to protect the state. So probably the army should be just there to defend the state. But probably there should be a new constitution in Pakistan. So this is, you know, part of the question. Do you think there should be a new constitution of Pakistan? If you listen to Nawaz Sharif tone these days, they say that PML has now become a revolutionary, uh, very revolutionary thinking. Okay. So, okay. okay. Yeah. Thank you, Alan. Okay. Thank you. But this uh, tenure of uh, parliamentary yeah. government and all that sort of thing, I'm not very certain that these are fixed things. I mean, we've discussed this. National, National Assembly uh, No, it is only the parliament. You see, the, a, a parliamentary, a prime minister get, does not have a tenure. A prime minister goes any time the, the, the prime minister loses the, the confidence of the house. And the president also, or the queen in parliament, can dissolve the parliament at any time the prime minister advises the queen to do so. So, in, unlike a presidential system, in a parliamentary system, actually, there is no fixed term. But what you are talking about is the five-year term that normally a parliament exists. But it's not a term that is a right. You understand? The Prime Minister does not have to be around for five years. The Prime Minister can, can resign, can be defeated on the floor of the House, uh, the Parliament can be dissolved, etc. Not so in a, in, a, in a presidential form. But anyway, you know, but the question is, is still valid. Um, a National Assembly has not been dissolved. Yeah, yeah. The question is still valid. But I just wanted to say that it does not have a fixed Mr. Juma Boy. <coughs> Uh, mine actually ar arises from a, uh, uh, I think that appeared in the Pakistani newspaper from uh, uh, remarks of a former state governor uh, of Pakistan uh, who was concerned about how you would return the loans that you have taken from China uh, with your current position of having a debit every year. Uh, how far is that uh, 
problem or is there a problem anywhere there? And if, if there is, of course, uh, you have the sovereign right of cancelling the, the contract, but these loans have to be paid. And what is the, what is the very debit? This thing that appeared that in the, in, the, in the newspaper was that uh, it's a billion dollars a year. Uh, the question is, of course, I mean, you don't have to give the figures, amortization of 46 billion dollars. How is it going to be paid, right? Yeah. Thank you. First of all, I'd like to thank three speakers for the very candid, informative, and thought-provoking presentation. I would give first just an observation, I'd just like to say yes or no. If you prefer, I can give an answer. I spoke about how uh, 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 Sufi orders. Now, you have been good enough to tell me that you belong to Chistia order. Is that all right for me? No, no, I just wanted to ask, no, Akhwet, Akhwet, uh, the model you have, it reminds me of what the uh, Sufi orders used to do, what I have been, you know, from my limited knowledge of the Sufi order of the 13th, 14th centuries. I just want to know to what extent it is, and secondly, is your model representative of Sufi Islam of Pakistan out of the the scripturalistic or orthodox Islam. Now, uh, it, I hope I'm not embarrassing you, I just thought, uh, since I'm a sociologist, I thought the lyric that would be interesting. Can I continue with the question? Uh, yeah, well, you may, we don't have too much time. No, what I'll do is give everybody three minutes. I'll, I'll just, just yeah. very briefly to, to Mr. Kartar. One of the things that really as an academic concerns me, the absence of world-class universities in the Muslim world. It's going to imprison almost 30, 23, 25 percent of the, of the human population. And unless something happens in the intellectual relevance, which is basically the higher education in Muslim countries, I, was, I wonder what is going to be the future of Muslim work. General Kamen, thank you. I just wanted to tell you, in my survey, I asked people in Pakistan to trust in institutions and uh, I think I should mention to you the highest trust was army at 86%. And I was told not to tell the military because that might go to the head. And I'm just, just curious, why do you think people trust army so much? Okay, we will start from uh, right to left and go around the table for five minutes each. That is okay. Respond to, uh, I mean, the advantages of having many questions from the floor is that they respond like a cherry pick. Okay? But we all do that from that. That's a bit of that. So yes, my family has a very strong Sufi influence. From 14 generations, I'm Jishti. From 10 generations, I'm Lakshwati. And I'm proud of it. As well as who was closing to Sufism is concerned, I will not be able to say yes for the simple reason. That to me, the two most cardinal principles is that to us, Allah is the Rabbul Alameen. He is the uh, Rabb of all the worlds. And all the worlds include all the human beings. Likewise, Prophet Muhammad is the Rahmatul Alameen. He is a blessing for all the human uh, worlds and all the human beings. Nowhere where it said Muslims. And if there is there can't be any discrimination between Muslims and non-Muslims. How could be there blessings, any discrimination? We work with all of them. We work with Sufi shrines, Tata Saab, Shah Jamal, Yami, Azrat. We do work with those who don't believe in Sufis. We do work with Ashraf Ashris, many Imam Bargas, we do work. We work with church. We are now uh, one of our dream is to start the same program at Gurdwara Janam Asthan in Nankana Saab. We have a program in Nankana Saab and we realize that unless we get out of this thinking, 
to be or a human being, we have to work in the biggest, less, the biggest service could be the service to the humanity. And I think if that leads to Sufism, yes, we have Sufism. I agree with you. One of the problems has been the emphasis on quantity. Hello, this is the, the issue has been quantity. In fact, we should have been focusing on fewer universities because the quality of human capital has been spread very, very thin. So that has been one of the major constraints. Um, the second has been the way the state is handling all this, both from the private sector as well as the public sector, I mean, through that uh, presentation. But, but the real issue was the, the lack of commitment, rightly, to the quality of our education from the state, and be essentially the economic policy incentive structure, which didn't really create a demand for the kind of skills that we all have I mean, you know better than I. Research, anything of this nature, is actually from the best state. And the private sector really never had the kind of resources. Secondly, because of this tight regulatory system, a lot of resources of the private sector were actually ended up spread very thinly on uh, what you and I would call unproductive investments in the education. Finally, remember in Pakistan it's much easier to raise money for mosques than for hospitals. That's the way we are. Um, it's easier to do that. And then, even when it comes to education, it's at the school level. So you try and raise money for universities in terms of right to know in the packing order. That has they, they, this culture of also. <coughs> Two, three, uh, just one little point that I just want to emphasize from the point of the discussion on uh, the policy. And I think we haven't really made emphasis at the Pakistan level. And particularly because the cost of that is very low. Uh, and we haven't done so. You see, this Pakistan is the image of a very hard country. So we need a much softer image. And this being the age of soft power, we should be pushing examples like this just to be on the radar of the world where it gives us a soft image. The second area, which you know, is, should be highlighted, if you look at, I mean, if you talk to Pakistanis, uh, before Malala Yusuf, the best ambassador we had was a singer, was a Fateli Khan. So in a sense, we should have been pushing artists, um, singers, uh, actors, and they've done extremely well even in places like Bollywood. And finally, when even when you come to, I and mean, that is how we have witness uh, also from that angle, because we have been raising with them, the fashion designers, the you know, garment designers, the jewelry designers, and what is beautiful about it, most of them are females, so that gives a much softer image, in a sense, and that's the thing that we should be pushing for, to get ourselves on the radar, and the cost of that is so low. And the services sector, finally a friend of ours talked about the services sector, and that's the services sector we should be pushing it again, it was because of the regulatory framework which has affected the services sector. And that is why you ended up with low quality services that you could afford. Yeah, very true. One of the reasons why we have Mr. Ranja here, by the way, is to project the soft picture of Pakistan that you said. And that would be we organize this meeting. That was my idea. Uh, look at your face batteries. <laughs> One uh, remark on the overseeing democracy. Uh, what I meant was that no one in Pakistan wants the military in a political leadership role. They don't want the military to intervene and they don't want the military to take over and they don't want the military to run the country. They want the political government to run the country through all the existing institutions. And the general feeling is that our institutions are very strong. Financial, banking, bureaucracy, everything is very strong. It just needs competent heads to get them moving. So this is what they want. 
because of this uh, credibility problem and this inability to orchestrate national power through these existing institutions, there is this feeling that the military should be somewhere lurking in the background to put things right if they go wrong. That's all I meant. There's no question of the military getting into a formal overwatch position to look over the shoulder of the credibility. That's not going to work. The other Vankiza's uh, uh, question and uh, Ambassador Istakar's uh, comment, I think in every country the military gives input into strategic policy. Somewhere it's formalized, somewhere it's informal and so on, but it is uh, very much there. In our case now, right now, we have a National Security Council, we have a National Security Advisor and we have a National Security Secretary. These are new developments, they were not there before. They are there and they are functional and they have had a number of uh, meetings. So uh, one assumes that the military will be formally giving its view in those forums. Then I think it's uh, going to as far as uh, the culture aspect is concerned, uh, we don't have a German general staff system in that sense. But uh, I don't know if the Crown can help me put it better, but what we do have is a system of continuous evaluation during the training process where you get separated into streams. Nobody says that this man is meant to be only a general staff of but it's automatic. And your career shows that. I mean, if as a captain you are in an operations position, if as a major you are in an operations position and you get higher up in the ranks and continue on command and operational, then obviously you are headed there are others who may be headed in other directions. So this uh, bifurcation, uh, unannounced, un and not as a policy takes place in the military, that has a lot to do with safeguarding the core culture of the institution through these hardcore officers whose only motivation is professional excellence. The other question, the, the two fingers which uh, Ram made, he gave out a lot of information, but in a, in a, in a conversation with the previous uh, Prime Minister on the National Security Council, he said that they would, uh, I, and it was a revelation to me, because that's the first time I found how a politician looks at things. He said in a National Security Council meeting, there would be four four stars, 16 stars facing us, and I can't tolerate it. So, so there you have it. But that was a point of view which I understood, and I looked at it from their point of view, that how they feel about that situation. The other question, whose finger is of the party, is the Prime Minister's. In the National Command Authority, which is responsible for development, employment, and everything about the strategic assets. It is the Prime Minister who chairs it, and it is the Prime Minister who will be giving the Prime Minister. It might need somebody's support, but it, he will be the one that single. The question on the political parties, it is just uh, one correction. It was not uh, President Asif Ali Zardari who gave up the power to dismiss the assemblies. It was President Farooq Lawari. It was President Farooq Lawari who, in a discussion with the Prime Minister, said, yes, this is how the President should have the power to dismiss the assembly, the, the parliament, and it should be, it should not be there. So that's how it was done away with. President Asif Ali Zardari gave up his finger on the button. He said, if I will not be chairing the National Command Authority, it will be the Prime Minister. So since then, it is the Prime Minister who is the chair. That was it.
extent he went was to allow prime ministers to do more than three times. Very good. One minute. One minute. Okay, one minute. One minute. Say. As for Madam General Sir, I think his court, President Farooq Ghani, surrendered his right to dissolve the assembly in May, April 1997, and President Asif Zardari again did the same thing once because in between President Musharraf has taken it over. So it was both of them. Okay, good. Uh, all right, I'll pass on of course. But uh, just I want to make a comment about the finger on the button. <laughs> oh, big uh, This is as a, as a practical political scientist and a diplomat. The answer is no one knows. No one knows. Uh, in America, the president has the finger on the button, not as the representative of the electoral college, as the president is, uh, but as the commander in chief of the forces. You see, so it is not delinked from the military. Then again, the president's signature, signature meaning the, the button, you see, would have to be authenticated by the defense secretary, who is an unelected person. You see, now there is no way to reverse the decision commander in chief. But the defense secretary might not authenticate the signature in the sense that the defense secretary might take the position that the signature is not genuine, which buys time. So no one really knows when push comes to shove what will happen, what will happen in a situation like that. It is inconceivable though, I and mean, common sense will tell you, that uh, one of the most practical laws of, of governance ever since Herbert Spencer and all others have been. Those who do the have those who do the fighting would ultimately in one way or another choose between war and peace. You see? So therefore, in a situation like that, it has not arisen in the past. We don't know what in France who, who, who would do that. But if the practical answer to that is no one knows and it will be a consultative action. It will have to be done very quickly, but it is not done by just one individual. Just as an aside on this, there's a movie, uh, it's about a submarine, where the, uh, where the communication is broken down and the commander decides, orders the launch of a nuclear strike yes. on Russia. Yes. And the executive officer disagrees with him. He says, we have to wait for the communication to be stored because this has implications. The captain orders him to stand down and tells him that I will fire. The executive officer says I will not authenticate the order because he's also got a complete The captain orders them to arrest the executive officer and push his finger. And this executive officer then mutinies, takes over the submarine, puts the captain under arrest, and the situation is retrieved just in time because they get a communication not to fire. And yeah. then there's a court martial. I believe it's based on a real life. Yeah, that, that is true. I mean, of course, this is a, a fiction, but what I'm saying is very practical. That will happen. Also, in DEFCON 11, which is the highest, highest alert, when the submarine commander goes into the submarine, when the uh, aircraft pilot goes into the air, into the aircraft and just waits for the final order. Now, it is very difficult to communicate an order to the submarine. So when it is DEFCON 11 alert situation, Certain submarine commanders may believe that they have the right to, uh, to, uh, to fire. So, you know, it's not just the president who can do this. That is a very good question. Hiroshima Nagasaki was authorized by President Truman, as far as, uh, as I'm aware, but there would have been a consultative process. When uh, General MacArthur wanted, wanted the same power in, in, in Korea, he was sacked. You see, the immediate response of the president was to dismiss him. You see, so this is not, this has not been an easy, easy, easy uh, situation in Hiroshima, Nagasaki, and uh, it, but generally, please understand that even in the most advanced political systems, uh, no single person can take a decision of that magnitude. There is, uh, if the enormous amount of stuff coming out in the newspapers, uh, reasonably well informed about a 
uh, what's likely to happen if Trump decides to attack North Korea with nuclear weapons. And the consensus of people who have been writing, and these are knowledgeable people, is that now there are three guys in place, Mattis, McMaster, and John Kelly. And they will come together and they will do what Shlesinka and Kissinger did to Nixon, i.e. anything that this guy says will have to be ratified by these three working together. Last days of Nixon's. Yeah. Right. Okay. 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 Thank you, first of all, and thank you for having me here such a distinguished panel. And of course, I've spoken about that I'd like to talk about the speakers who came afterwards. Uh, first of all, start with Mr. Salim Ranjan. Of course, we work with him the national tuition. And I tell you, a lot of things are happening, you know, which are, we are, like I said earlier, that we are taking quantum leaps. You know, I mean, just to give you an idea about the committee, thing of women, you know, first one, our bank is starting this Afna Mil program, right, and it's like that, soon for that, and sort of having the mobile wallets, the people who are seven in class on the 23rd, uh, they find that their salaries are out to go to go to suit for as much as 10% interest per month, right? So, with the mobile wallet, you can, you can actually ask for a salary up to date for up to the 15th of the month, and you will get it back and without any decision, just for a small uh, administration fee, for a service fee. So, these are things which are, uh, you know, progressing as we speak. I think one of the great things, we talk about the army all the time, about the institution, the great amount of uh, credit and trust. We lose the fact that a state bank of Pakistan has been an icon. It has done terrifically well, despite many times people trying to do it. And people have designed that. Mr. Shahid Khata, the pressure has been put to do the wrong thing. And I, you know, we don't want to just do it. Because they have stood their ground, not allowed this institution. If this institution had collapsed and when the world banking institution were all melting down, Pakistan would have been down the line. So there are institutions in Pakistan which are really, really uh, doing the job. And, uh, and of course, not the least the last of that itself. I find a great fundamental change in the army to what it was 40 years ago, 30 years ago, 20 years ago. The main reason is, the main reason is, the smell of product, the sound of a bullet going back to me. The moment a person who has been in combat realizes and he understands that what you, you can die in combat, you can get killed, and he becomes much more mature. But then when he comes into an institution where the army is an institution, and I actually quite a bit of in the National Defense University, the Air Force War College, you find that the quality of officers is substantially improved. And therefore, they are much more inclined towards democracy right, than the, the impatience of the earlier kind. And that's why you see the last 10 years, despite a lot of provocation, a lot of invitation, provocation and invitation, that uh, the army has not stepped in or said something like that, except one or two odd cases will happen. But the army is not kept away. Uh, I think it is fair to say that uh, what is what Pakistan really needs, Pakistan really needs is a proper electoral system where there is grassroots democracy, where power is devolved down to the local bodies, financial power. Right? Otherwise, you will have problems. I just give you an example of a political system that can you. Three parties. Then in coalition in Karachi. The ANP and the NK. You went, people used to get people used to murder something, used to get caught, go to the police station, right? They used to be treated and dying. And then in the morning walk up the garments and, and nobody could do a damn thing about it. Right? The people was in power and sin, the people in power in the federal government. 
Similarly, MQN, one word, the MQN key could close down the It just didn't matter what it was. Just close that close down, close down the Can you imagine the hub, the economic hub of the country go down when they just did that? Then it came around similarly like this, whether it was a Fata, a Swap, uh, you know, people came to 60, uh, 60 kilometers of Islam. When uh, this uh, one came down, he came to the 60 kilometers of Islam. Alright? And he would have been back to bring mayhem. So sometimes, the who went and did the cleaned up crash? Of course, under the edges of the political government in power. But the ranges. And the thing is, just the ranges, you know, the ranges, officer by the way, for the Poor commander there who was really? actually looking after the fair has been shown. Yes. And what happened? If the moment you started accountability, the moment you started accountability, the political party or the government says we won't have accountability. So if a man is if a man is guilty of this thing, so who I mean today if you have a political party which does not want accountability, which does not want to appear as they are openly in corruption, openly in uh, misusing police for political, for political purposes for, uh, and for uh, the absolute decisions. Uh, ultimately, yeah, yeah. there is a place where things become very, very common to be safe. You cannot just take it away that the constitution. What will you do if the state collapses? I think, as it almost collapsed in Karachi, what will you do if the state collapses? Right? I mean, I was in Karachi. I was being threatened. I was being attacked. Right? My children were being attacked. I had to take the children out of the country. <coughs> and similarly, a lot of people had to get the children out of the country out of Karachi. They were all coming back now. But the state did come here, where Karachi was ruled by gangsters. And the gangsters were in this, were being run by the political party. Each had their own What do you do? Which constitution was that man following that? <coughs> Certain accountability actions will be taken. Now, it's all very well to say the sitting Prime Minister has been dethroned uh, in time. The sitting Prime Minister was made on something which the Supreme Court found wrong. The references that have been filed against him amount to billions and billions and billions of rupees which have moved out of Pakistan, which have ended up in various accounts, which a proper inquiry has been done at the behest of the Supreme Court. Which of the judges that sided with them in the first instance. Right? So you just can't say so just tell your Prime Minister as in uh, this thing, Abdullah Bhutto passes a remark. <coughs> Accountability is a process that must be carried out. And it must be carried out everywhere, whether it's politicians, judges, or uh, generals, or it uh, does not matter. It has to happen. And if in this case it's happened, if documents have turned up for it, documents have turned up for it, in not one case, there were 100 cases, something is wrong. And you cannot say, oh, democracy would survive because the Prime Minister. By the way, democracy survived. The Prime Minister went. Smooth transition, nothing happened. So, there are all those who would say, the army was behind it. The army was really behind it. They were moved in. And they didn't, it wouldn't have taken this thing. Like people said, it was taken one truck and a jeep uh, to the Pakistan delegation. I just wanted to follow up with Mr. Kalgar. I think it's a, this is a this is general context. I mean, I'm very I, I concerned about the, 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 the not concerned, but I'm surprised by the fears given on uh, private, privatization, the development of private education. I'm not an economist, and there are very distinguished economists here that can correct me. The history of education, higher education, shows that no private, private sector simply cannot, cannot produce knowledge. It cannot be for the production of knowledge. It has to be the state. And I just... It has to be the... The state. I mean, throughout, in almost all modern countries, it is the state which makes the most... Is there effect, and was it only the fact that the church provided education? Well, we're talking about modern times. 
in modern times. Of course, they are in the world of justification. Yeah, not in Oxford and Cambridge. I mean, but not, not anymore. Not anymore. Not anymore. But, so I'm talking of the privatization of knowledge. Uh, I understood it to be the failure of public education, and Michael responded to it. But essentially, the markets cannot cannot produce knowledge. Cannot cannot you know, markets work on the profitability principle. And without state's investment, it would be impossible to have a viable, productive, innovative, and creative education system. And the statistics that um, I think I you shared with us seem to be concerning in the sense that the state is really abdicating its responsibility of actually producing, uh, investing in knowledge. And I, I can give you statistics on various, I mean, the production of scientific papers in the Muslim world are lowest per thousand population. Only two countries which have improved a little bit over the last five or ten years are Iran and Turkey, which actually started from a low base. Uh, the six, seven countries which invest least in education are Muslim and invest most in, in armaments. But these are figures which you know, I'm sure you probably know or I mean, we can talk about them. But my, my concern is how can state be abdicating responsibility in production of knowledge and production of funding in universities and schools? Because as far as I know, two institutions must be under the state control in, in modern world. One is the institution of coercion, the other one is education. And is Pakistan, I mean, coercion is the you know, army and police is under the state. But the education one is just so central to the survival and, and, and development of the society. I think I need to respond to that. I think we need to understand that there is a difference between financing versus providing the service yourself. I'm saying it is the responsibility of the state to fund and ensure the outcomes for which it is funding, which is very different from the state itself being in the business providing the service. That's all I'm saying. So the funding, yes, the quality of funding has been low, uh, sort of quantum, and the quality of the the nature of the funding, because it has been supporting some regulatory structures rather than actually focusing on productive investments, has been poor. All I'm saying is we need to move away from the state providing the service to being in the business of funding and actually linking funding to outcomes in which research can be won and so on and so forth. I wasn't actually criticizing it, but I was just concerned about the statistics. The statistics are very poor. All I'm saying is that what we should be thinking about from giving more money, much more importantly, do not sink more money into an existing system which has become totally dysfunctional, i.e. the public sector delivery system. It's become totally dysfunctional. That's why I'm saying we need to shift more away from that system. And I'm glad in some way that we haven't actually poured more Money into bad. Okay, we'll have the last question. Your second question was pending, asked very quickly, and then I'll go back. He'll answer. He'll answer the question. Okay, well, you, you might want to repeat it for Surya's sake. You see, I just said uh, $46 million. $36 billion is coming for power projects and $10 billion for roads and uh, for project uh, uh, bridges, etc. Now, you pay for the power projects like you do for any project in any commercial organization. You produce electricity, the electricity gets sold, and among the, when you have a project, you have part of it as a of the loan. Because you are short of electricity now, you are, you are uh, at the moment, some of your manufacturing is the most important thing only for eight hours, seven, eight hours a day. And the rest of them, even they cannot work, even the full function. So when you produce more and they will be able to pay, they will 
use the electricity, pay for the electricity, that electricity paid for retail and the loan. So, that is a national problem. That's, 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 paying of loan is always a problem. To start with. Paying of loan is always a problem. It's not so easy. Loans are only 10 billion out of the 46. Loans are only 10 billion out of the 46. 36 billion is investment. Investment. 10 billion yeah, 10 billion. But uh, let me tell you that when Mr. Jawad Barki and myself were proceeding to the Sarkar disease, uh, uh, and I don't think anyone, anyone in the subcontinent knows, knows more about this kind of transactions than Mr. Sarkar disease. He's been at it for as long as I was a child. And he told us that you cannot believe, you cannot believe what a great relief it is to have a grown up like child. You see? So, uh, I know from my own country's experience, and I've also worked in the time information, that Bangladesh amortization is not a problem in Bangladesh. Of course, there are many major recipients of, of Chinese credit. But uh, this is what uh, Mr. Sardajati said. He's on the board, and now he's gone back to the time information himself. Uh, it can be a problem. It may not be a problem. We do not know. But uh, what the uh, way is good, why not make full use of parties? Chinese money, and we'll be far, far worse off without it than we are with it. Yes. So, uh, you know, this uh, discussion is going on in Pakistan, uh, but it is very poorly informed in my view. Uh, people are saying that Pakistan is going to become a colony of China, Pakistan is going to be bankrupted by China, Pakistan will never be able to what it is borrowing. Uh, yeah. And some of the reasonably good economists have written articles on this suggesting what I'm saying. But this is, uh, I'm surprised that it's been put that way. Let me give you some very simple arithmetic. I did an exercise uh, last year, and this was in connection with, uh, uh, with a think tank that has been set up in Pakistan, of which I am a member and now IFTI has become a member. It's called the Astana Group. And these people are uh, debating these kinds of issues. And in that context, I did an exercise that if the Chinese provide $60 billion over a 10-year period, it could result in increasing Pakistan's GDP by 2.7% a year which is $8 billion a year. If this money is coming in at say $4 to $5 million a year, then the total payment is about $3 billion. So Pakistan is a net winner in terms of $5 million if all of it is on semi-commercial terms. Now I know, because I've been talking to the Chinese about this, it's a mixture of all kinds of words. Some of it is equity finance, some of it is grant, and some of it is on a commercial basis. So this business that Pakistan will go bankrupt as a result of this is rubbish. It is a game changer for Pakistan. Pakistan will have enormously benefited. Ten years from now, the shape of the country and the shape of the economy and the position of the country is going to change. I have been saying that as a result of this, Pakistan will be quite literally lifted out of South Asia and placed in Central Asia. That's what the Chinese want and that's what I think the Pakistanis are going to end up with. And the same sentiments were, by the way, uh, reflected by our finance minister, a gentleman called Mr. M. M. Moody, who is a very, very senior person and uh, who is even senior to, uh, to uh, Mr. Berkey. Uh, he, he told me that uh, across the board, this <coughs> is three and a half, four percent at most, and he, he doesn't see it as a problem, and he's been finance minister for off and on for about 30 years. Anyway, uh, uh, last question. Uh, yeah, uh, just a uh, uh, clarification. First of all, uh, General Sat, I made a direct uh, reference to the 18th Amendment of the Pakistan Constitution. that was signed by Zertavi. It's the same an, an amendment that we named NWFP to Khaibar Taktunikwa, as well as you know, on, on presidential powers. It's 18th Amendment. 
And uh, just for Mrs. Uh, Suryava's uh, inf information, when Nawaz Sharif was, um, was uh, disqualified, in his first speech, he actually very proudly said that, um, that I had the only finger that has pressed the nuclear button, button of Pakistan. And he has both boasted this in his rallies before that his finger was the only finger that have pressed the Pakistan's nuclear button. Okay, my question is on the future of um, Pakistan. As the census report recently has come out showing uh, 207 million and uh, Pakistan population has grown a lot. I have read a report that by 2035, the population of Pakistan will be 300 million. I'm sure, you know, when I'm much uh, older and grey hair, probably Pakistan will be a nation of half a billion. And the, the thing is that how, how is Pakistan actually going to sustain this economic, economic growth? Things like education, health service, electricity. And one thing I would say is that, you know, take away democracy from Pakistan, Pakistan still can survive. But there's one thing that Pakistan cannot survive with, and that's the industry run. The day the industry um, runs dry, then that will be the end of Pakistan. And you know, what, what, what is, the, is there any uh, solution, is there any forward thinking on Pakistan long term? How are we going to ensure that Pakistan actually um, continues to live until doomsday? Oh, Mr. So Raja has, a, has volunteered to ask you. Starting from Indus, we have to see who is trying the Indus rivers and who is now putting pressure on Pakistan for the river wars. We have to see. We have, we have talked enough. But we move from economy, we move from social service, again to strategy, again to war, again to... It is always half class full and half class empty. We must realize we are I mean, except few people on the side, I mean, most are post-independent generation. We don't, I mean, the Wali Khan is a very interesting saying when he was in Hyderabad, and somebody asked whether you are a Pathan, whether you are a Pakistani, whether you are Muslim. He said, I am a Pathan for 4,000 years, I am a Muslim for 1,400 years, and a Pakistani for 30 years. We must think that, yes, we are Pakistani and Indian, but we are also South Asian, we are also Asian. Our destinies are linked with each other. If we try to destroy each other, we both will be destroyed. See what happened after the uh, unfortunate event of attack on the parliament in New Delhi. A lot of this Indian IT business moved away from South India. And people of South Asia got unemployed. We must realize that a uh, very uh, Dr. Barki, Rishad Javid Barki Sabe said, what if? Imagine if, what if the IP before this CPAC, CPAC had IPI taken place? What if? If TAPI would have already taken place? What if Indians seeking trade concession from Pakistan had in voluntarily invested in India, in Pakistan, five to ten billion dollars in 2004 and five. Today, the same position with China is enjoying, India could have enjoyed. And so, these new things, what happened? Had Afridi would be playing in IPL, or Virat Kohli would have been playing in PSL, who lost this opportunity. Forget it, I think we should move on. And together with cricket, together with Sufism, together with party innovation, we can start a new association. And believe me, sir, just for me, a very interesting say is when I went to Frankfurt Museum. And please, if any one of you can go to Frankfurt Museum, do see a model when you walk into the museum. There are two models, Frankfurt 1939, a hustling, bustling town, and next to is Frankfurt 1945. Whole Frankfurt destroyed except one church. We have two options, either mutual assured destruction or mutual assured prosperity. Yeah, absolutely. It's very, it's very good. And in fact, uh, just to unders underscore that in other area, because we do not want to uh, take away from it any kind of acrimonious relationship even on the fighting side that we assure you that I have spent many years, many years as 
ambassador to the United Nations in New York and Geneva, 11 years in fact. I've been involved in peacekeeping operations right from the get-go. Uh, I can tell you that there is no three elements or, 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 or actors who cooperate as well as India, Pakistan, and Bangladesh do as in global peace, uh, international peacekeeping in Africa. You see, it is the Indian ambassador, it is Munir Akram, and it is myself who for years on end worked to advance in a combined fashion the perceived interest of not just our armed forces, but also obviously our, our countries. I can give you practical examples of the DPRK, Congo, there were nine Bangladeshis who were killed once on a, on a uh, 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 patrol, this thing. Next day the Pakistanis came and cleared it out. So you see, this is a tremendous kind of cooperation that beyond the radar, beyond the civilian radar or the public radar, whatever you call it, this kind of cooperation is going on. So when kind of people like that get together, just as we do in ISAS, we have Pakistanis, we have Indians, and we have Bangladeshis, we have civil servants, we have diplomats, and we have researchers, we work together, and we see ourselves as really one, which is why we are having this event, and which is why we will have, a, have similar events on, uh, on India as well, and also on Bangladesh in, in February. Would you like to take the next 10 minutes to sort of spell out as what we intend to how we the, what the next steps would be, and then I'll just wrap up by thanking everybody for it. Yeah. <coughs> I don't think I need 10 minutes. I'll, I'll do it quite briefly. Uh, first, about this particular meeting, I think it, it turned out to be much, much better than uh, both yeah, you and I had expected. Uh, we were getting, we were hoping to get uh, more than uh, six people assembled over here as uh, presenters. Two persons who couldn't come would have talked about Pakistan's relations with the world outside. Unfortunately, there were visa problems and they couldn't make it. Uh, this particular project, of which this is a part, is something that uh, Iftafar Chaudhary talked about with the people over here, and then he pulled me into it. The project is really has three aspects. Uh, one is to understand what Pakistan is. Uh, it is my belief, and I believe uh, it is shared by Iftafar Chaudhary, that Pakistan is a misunderstood country. In fact, it is not even understood by the Pakistanis themselves. I was mentioning to somebody, uh, either at lunch or one of the coffee breaks, that I am always surprised as to how much negative talk goes on in Pakistan about Pakistan. Once uh, uh, a woman who writes for uh, Washington Post, Pamela Constable is her name, she said to me, do you find my writing very negative about Pakistan? Because that's what the Pakistanis say. And I said to her, well, it's not positive. And she said, I'm a reporter. I live in Islamabad. I'm invited to a lot of functions, cocktails and so on and so forth. I have never heard Pakistanis talk well about their country. And this is a variety of reasons. Uh, it's done less well than people hoped and so on and so forth. Jinnah's dream, August 11, the famous speech and so on. Uh, the country is misunderstood. And one aim of this exercise is to make it better understood both by Pakistanis and by the people outside. I live in the United States. And the United States, in particular, does not understand Pakistan. And they are now coming up with bizarre conclusions about Pakistan and so on and so forth. So that's one purpose of uh, this particular exercise. We have uh, a number of papers. Some of them will be done by you, and some of them will be done by other people we have identified. And then uh, Ifti and I have begun to talk to a publisher, and Pellin, Palgrave, they have shown interest in bringing it out. So I hope we can do this quickly. Those of you who have not submitted your uh, uh, chapters, I hope we can do them quickly. And you have my chapter, and you have uh, uh, 
and Yaza Sun's chapter, and then there are about four or five others that have been completed, and I will be circulating those around. The second thing that we want to do is uh, what Pakistan is today and how it get and how it got there is the first set of issues. The second is uh, where Pakistan would go in the next five, ten years or so. It could obviously go bad or it could obviously go good. So we will define two scenarios and then uh, uh, see. Uh, as I said, I'm an optimist, and obviously the focus will be on the opti optimistic side of uh, the outcome. And the third, and this is where the contributions by people such as Shahid Kardar and Salim Raja and the uh, Trump uh, cycle come in. How do we get there? Uh, that's an extreme, extremely important policy issue with which I hope we will be able to influence policy makers, not only in Boston, but also in uh, Washington, Delhi, and so on and so forth. And in all this, uh, some issues which are still being uh, sort of debated about, not full understanding, uh, will be developed at some length. Uh, Jangir Kalamath will, as he has uh, said in his very good presentation today, the role of the military, and we hope we can get somebody and we haven't thought of that person is the role of the judiciary in developing Pakistan. So all these things uh, uh, will be part of this exercise. What I'm proposing to uh, the people over here is that uh, if the Khaj Chaudhary spends a couple of weeks with me in the hall and we will take, take a research assistant with us and we will finalize uh, uh, the document presenting to the publishers in about March. So I'm going to request you all to please uh, send you your uh, contributions. Uh, hopefully by the end of this month, you have done a lot of thinking and uh, it should be for that a greater problem. I have developed a way of communicating with all of you and we will keep you uh, in touch with you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Yeah, we will do all this with regard to Pakistan, of course, and eventually, as we have, you have heard, we have similar, similar ideas and programs about uh, India and Bangladesh. We will extrapolate from those sessions uh, what really brings us together. We have spoken about it uh, for so long that we have now thought in this think tank that we should move forward with some practical, practical ideas. Or as the, the uh, mighty Rabindranath Tagore has said, uh, if you wish to cross the sea, uh, it will not do to stand uh, at its shores and simply stare at the waters. I want to thank you very much. Thank you for being here. Thank you all. And I declare the workshop closed. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, distinguished speaker. May I request the Chair, Dr. Chaudhary, to present to Yafu Isis, our guest speakers, with a token of appreciation, please. To Mr. Um, and General Jahangir Karamat. To Mr. Shahid Kartal. And Mr. Salim Ramza. Thank you. Thank you to our distinguished speakers and thank you to the audience for your kind attendance and participation.